Okay, the meeting is being recorded, um, so we will have that for our record. Um, all right, so Alex Bailey, I see Ashton. We have Katie, our ASL interpreter. Thank you, Katie. Bill Peterson, Cynthia Lau, and please, if I misstate your your name, correct me. I see David, Davis Harper, Doug, did Doug get back on? There he is. Great, you made it back. Exar, Oliveris, Electra, Edward, Francisco uh, Don Donez. Um, I see a G Prost. I think that's Gary Prost. Gary, okay. It, it is indeed. Thank Welcome, you. Gary. Thank, Thank you I'm for coming. Learning. I'm still so learning. Gary, Gary's the local rep for Congressman McNerney. So. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jason Cashman with the port. Jason Katindoy with the port. Jeff, as you all know. Uh, John Spagnaro, Jonathan yes. Pruitt, Jordan Peterson, Katie Chamberlain, Margo, Maria, uh, Melissa Vargas, Moricott, Nick Pierce, Nicholas, uh, Tam Tamayo or Tamayo. Randall, Renee, Shannon, Scott Wall, uh, Tammy, and Victoria, and then I see Willie. Okay, I think I got everyone that's here as of now. We probably will have some additions as the meeting goes on. Um, we do have a full agenda, um, so I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint in just a moment. But there were a couple things we wanted to highlight from our last meeting. Um, one of the action items was to continue scheduling port tours. And I know Jeff has been working diligently with a lot of different groups to get those scheduled. Anything you want to report out on that, Jeff? Um, well, it's been a little busy lately, so I've only, I think I've only done 2 since the last meeting, maybe 3. Um, our last 1 was yesterday. Um, uh, Willie, actually, he took uh, the tour last last week. I don't know Willie if you want to, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't join you. But is there anything you wanted to highlight or let the group know about your tour? Yeah, no, thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, peace, uh, Pete Crossgard was able to give me the uh, port tour. Really great informational tour of the history, the history of it, of it, what is in the port's jurisdiction, what's not, um, what is in their control, and what is not. Um, I think Jeff, you and I were planning to have a further discussion about actual um, environmental impact, but uh, I had I highly recommend it if you ever have a spare day, spare time. Uh, go out there and kind of understand what are the cross functional partners that the port has to deal with to uh, make sure that they're bringing jobs to the uh, neighborhood here. Great, thanks, Willie. Um, um, and so, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. I, I just uh, Matt Holmes took a tour yesterday, and and I know there are others that I'm trying to get to Mary Elizabeth. I know I'm trying to schedule something for you in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and Margo reached out, but. Uh, Matt, you want to hit on some of the highlights of the tour yesterday? Yeah, I'm really sorry I'm late. Um, you know, holy cow, right? Like the Port of Stockton is a major industry. <laughs> it's a major engine, and there's a lot unfolding out there. And so just sort of understanding the nuance between marine and in inland areas and the number of tenants that they have going on there, um, I just... I can say that I see lots of opportunity for collaboration between community and the port. Um, and I really think um, it's an opportunity to sort of cast a new day out there. Um, that that port's valuable and industry should consider itself lucky to do business there. And I wanna help them uh, pay through the nose for doing business in Stockton and supporting our port and supporting those of us that live in near port communities. Thanks, Matt. 
So I will be in touch, but if you haven't had the opportunity or you, you haven't reached out to me via email or cell phone, please do so and uh, we'll get something scheduled. Great. Um, some of the other questions that were asked that we were going to get back to you on were are listed in the meeting summary. If you hadn't had a chance to review that uh, meeting summary, they are there, but a couple of key things. On the strategic planning process, um, we did connect with the strategic planning team to just get an understanding. I know many of you are interested in reviewing the, the, the draft plan when it's available. Um, and it was originally on schedule to be pushed out this summer. Um, they did actually um, slow down the process a bit. There is a draft in internal review right now. And the expectation is hopefully by late fall, um, end of this year, there will be a draft available um, for uh, your review. So as we learn more about that process, we'll continue to uh, reach back to this group and share it with you um, so you can stay connected to that strategic planning effort. Um, and I think that those were the biggest things that we wanted to report out. And again, as I said, there's some answers to your questions in the summary as well from the last meeting. Um, so I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint real quick. Give me one quick second. The only other one thing I wanted to mention, Kim, real quick, is that um, myself, the port director, and a couple other port staff did meet. Uh, we, we were invited to the Boggs Track Sustainable Transportation Plan meeting. And um, it was it was a it was a really good evening, and some of you were in attendance. And if things like that come up, um, you know, utilize, re reach out to us, let us know, and we'd be happy to to attend. Or if we can't, um, you know, we're working. I've talked to Regina about um, doing kind of an emergency notice uh, system from the port. Uh, in case of emergency, but also we can utilize that Everbridge system to make announcements to the adjacent neighborhood and kind of through, you know, the South Stockton area. So, um, we can use that tool. So, if you have anything that you, uh, any engagements or, or meetings that you think would benefit the community, please reach out to us and, and we can hopefully attend and if not, uh, broadcast the information. Great, thank you. Okay, I just need to ask, can you see the full screen of the PowerPoint, the agenda? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we um, we actually have a couple of guest speakers today. Um, Starcrest will be here talking about their emissions inventory process, as well as Denmar. Um, so those are on the up first, and then um, Jeff and the port staff will discuss um, the strategy development for the emissions reductions at the port. So that is our agenda. This was one of the main priority topics um, that we heard from this group. So we thought it appropriate to start off today with, um, with this information. So we um, will go ahead and let the present, let Starcrest present, but I do have a pause after their slides for us to be able to ask questions. Um, so with that, Jeff, you want to introduce? Yes, uh, Randall Pasek has been working with us. Um, you know, in 2020, it's kind of confusing because it is called a, the 2018 emission inventory. So you would think we did it in 2018. We actually started the process in 2020, looking back on what was our busiest year to kind of give us a, a baseline kind of worst case scenario of our emissions to date. And then we're preparing to do another one for the year 2020. Um, in the very near future, I think Randall's just kicking that off now, but I uh, wanted to bring him um, in to kind of talk about the process a little bit, talk about the information, what we can learn, ways uh, that we can use that information in the future to make planning decisions and uh, that could benefit this group. So, Randall, if you wouldn't mind. Um, well, thank you, Jeff. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, wanted to just touch base kind of on the 2018 inventory and how, what an inventory is and kind of how you go through developing one and, and how you can use it. But before we go there, I wanted to introduce Starcrest. Um, Starcrest was chosen by the Port of Stockton to do the inventory. We've got uh, lots of experience on doing emissions inventories for, for the maritime industry. We've done over 50, uh, probably even more than that now, um, inventories for marine ports all over the world. And, um, and especially several on the West Coast. 
And we've also helped in developing emissions reduction programs for these ports um, because part of their emissions inventory work is always trying to, to what are you going to do next to reduce emissions. Uh, we've done a lot of work on port sustainability and um, and we just have worked with regulatory agencies, community groups, seaports, maritime association, and the maritime industry um, since our inception back in 1997. So that's a little bit about us. Um, next slide, please. So I want to say basically, what is an emissions inventory? You've heard about what it is. And what, what, it, what it does is you sit down and, and estimate the air pollutants that are coming from the major port related mobile sources. Mobile sources are ones that move, obviously. Um, and so it doesn't include buildings and things like that because um, historically, the ports have been more focused on mobile sources and their emissions and controlling emissions from those. So the five major categories that are most ports always have are ocean going vessels, which are the big uh, ships that come in and bring the goods, the goods movement, cargo handling equipment, which um, helps move the cargo from the ships to the trucks or to the trains to move it out into, into the communities. Um, rail, which are locum, which is basically the locomotive emissions, um, which are part of moving the goods from the ships to the final destination. Um, On-road vehicles, which includes trucks and automobiles, um, and then a harbor craft, which in support of Stockton's instances is tugboats, but can also include ferries and other parts for different ports. So next slide, please. Um, so what pollutants do we typically inventory? What are we looking at? And these are the, the pollutants that are chosen most because these are the ones that drive the health risks from air pollution. And these include NOx or nitrogen oxides, and these are key players in the development of ground level ozone and particulate matter, which have both have very um, important and very adverse health consequences. Um, you know, PM has been related to premature death. Ozone has been related to asthma and other uh, respiratory illnesses. Um, hydrocarbons, so NOx, that's the other one. Those are the ones that NOx and hydrocarbons, along with sunlight, they make ozone. Um, hydrocarbons can participate in development of PM as well. Particulate matter, uh, this is directly emitted particulate matter and also, as I mentioned, secondarily produced or produced in the atmosphere via chemistry. And uh, those are, uh, affects the respiratory system, the heart, it also has brain and uh, brain impacts and, and causes premature death. Um, the largest air toxic uh, contributor to the to the risk associated with um, carcinogenic risk from air pollution is diesel PM, and there's a lot of diesel engines working at the ports, and so that's uh, also inventoried and looked at. Sulfur oxides, uh, most of that has been dissipated because that's basically a fuel borne pollutant. So the SOX is in the fuel, or the sulfur is in the fuel. When you burn it, you make SOX. So. Um, there's been a lot of effort over the last three or four decades to reduce sulfur in fuels. And so that's been being knocked down. However, there's still quite a bit of it in ocean going vessel fuel. That is, so that's a big uh, component of the SOX emissions. Carbon monoxide interferes with the red blood cells ability to carry oxygen to your system. It can kill you. Uh, but again, it's a, with the improvement in engine design, uh, the carbon monoxide emissions from the from mobile sources has dropped a lot. And so it's not much of an issue anymore. It was back in the 70s, but not so much now. And then um, greenhouse gas emissions associated. Um, and those are responsible for global warming. I guess I didn't make it on the slide. Sorry about that. Um, so the global warming and all the issues associated with that, the increased stream weather events, the, the droughts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the ones that are typically looked at. Um, others can be done, but those are the ones that were uh, done here for the Port of Stockton. Next slide. So how are the emissions estimated? So emissions simply are, it's it's how often the, the emission source operates or runs times an emission factor. Um, they're usually, the emissions and estimates are usually recorded in tons per year. So those are tons of emissions per year. And the activity is determined for, it's try to determine for each individual vessel, vehicle, cargo hand equipment. Um, we try to get information on how many hours it operates or how many miles it drives in a year or how many gallons of fuel it uses in a year. And with that, that's the activity. With that activity and then emission factors, 
These have been developed over the years by the folks at EPA, by um, by academia and others in, in terms of how much mass pollutant is generated per amount of energy used by the piece of equipment. And so you just multiply the two together and that gives you your emission estimate. But the key here is really um, the number is, is the activity. How often is it used? How much is it used in a year? And then the emission factors are really dependent on the age of the equipment, and the size of the equipment. So a larger engine is going to give you a more mass for energy generated. Uh, it's going to generate, it's going to use more energy, so it's going to give you more mass overall. And then the age tends to be the older engines, as they wear out, they tend to emit more pollutants of certain kinds. And so that can be an important parameter as well. So next slide, please. So what are emissions inventories used for? Um, they're, they are, I mean, if, if anybody wants to determine, and this is used universally for planning of any kind of air pollution control program of any kind, you need to understand where the pollutant is coming from. And so from an important planning tool, it, it comes out and say, okay, what are our emissions? How much are our emissions? And what are the important sources that contribute to the emissions from whatever we're interested in? So it, it identifies the most important so sources of pollution, important being can be the largest or the ones that emit certain type of pollutants. It's kind of dependent on what your planning processes or purposes are. Um, and it's a key input because of this, it just tells you, okay, now that I understand where the pollution is coming from, what's causing my pollution, now I can decide what kind of strategies I want to use, what kind of programs I would like to put in place, or what other programs others have used to control emissions from these kinds of supports, um, categories, and what policies need to go put in for there. And so it gives you a big, a strong handle on, on it. it's an important first step in trying to figure out what to do next. And then once you've figured out what you're going to do next, it allows you to track the progress of these reduction programs by continually updating your image inventories. And you can actually determine and see how well your programs or your policies are working, how much of your emissions have been reduced since 2018. Yeah, if you do a 2020 or 2030 inventory, for example, you can look back and say, okay, in 2018, we had this many tons from this source category. We put in all these programs and look, now we're down to this number of tons. Look how effective or how ineffective our programs have been. And do we need to tweak it or reevaluate re or reinvent it? So very key, important prize. Um, and it's also a very good tool to, to, to share with the public, very transparent tool to say, okay, here's our emissions and here's what we've done about it. And so it's a very, it's um, record keeping, bookkeeping, accounting, um, just something like that. Those things can be used and can go be very helpful in in relaying what the ports and what whoever or whatever um, program you're looking at, how well it's been operating or what it's done. So next slide, please. So for the 2018 emissions inventory for the Port of Stockton, we went through the process. We looked at all the different individual vehicles and, and source categories out there. Uh, we got the activity information from all those. We used EPA approved and, and California Air Resources Board approved emission factors that have been used by others for other inventories. And so they're very well vetted, very well accepted. Um, we used methodologies to calculate activity from these types of sorecasters that had other ports have used that EPA has approved, that CARB has approved, CARB uses for their inventory development. And we came up with, um, and the and, and the, the pollutants are listed here in the tons per year of pollutants that were found. And kind of the, and I think this is just a, a table I left in here so folks could have, I'm assuming that this gets could be shared or someone could ask for it. So you have the exact numbers that we calculated. So that's it. But the next slide, can we go to the next one, actually shows more graphically kind of what we found. So these are probably... I don't want to say the most important pollutants, but these are the ones I mentioned before. P and NOx and hydrocarbons, they make ozone, they make particulate matter. Particulate matter directly emitted is a, is a, is a hazard. And then the global, the greenhouse gases, which we report in carbon dioxide equivalents. So it includes carbon dioxide emissions, methane emissions, and nitrous oxide emissions. And those are um, combined in a way so that they're equivalent, and then they're called CO2 equivalent emissions. And so... Some of the take home message here is that you can see ocean going vessels, and this is probably true for most ports. Ocean going vessels tend to be the largest contributor to emissions in the ports. Um, that's because they are very large engines. Um, they burn a lot of fuel and the fuel that they're allowed to burn typically is not nearly as clean as the fuels required by all the other sources to burn. So that's why they end up having the largest emissions. 
uh, at the Port of Stockton, the other four, four categories tend to contribute, depending on the pollutant, about the same amount of the four amongst themselves. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, from an inventory reporting tool, this kind of tells you, oh, if we're going to do something, we should probably think about focusing on ocean-going vessels because they contribute quite a bit. Now, that's just your starting point, and then it becomes, okay, what do we do? How do we go next? And so that's so this is kind of a graphical representation of that table that I showed earlier. Um, and I think so that's it. So the other thing is that's always kind of an interesting question that ports like to know is, well, how much do we contribute to the regional air quality, regional air emissions uh, uh, that we live in, the, the region that we live in? So the region that's important for Port of Stockton is Port of Stockton is in, is in the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. And the air pollution control districts generally um, encompass regions that are affected kind of by the same stuff. So they see kind of the same weather patterns. They see the kind of they have the same kind of meteorology. They have the, they have the same and the and the emissions that kind of are emitted there kind of stick around there. Um, you know the biggest uh, one regions in California are the Southern Cal or South Coast Air Quality Management District, which includes LA, Orange County, San Bernardino, Riverside counties. San Joaquin Valley includes all the Central Valley districts. The Bay Area includes several of the Bay Area counties. And those are in San and the Sacramento Air Quality Management District includes some of the, the counties around the Sacramento. So the regions are there. So the region that sort of Stockton is in is in the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. And as you can see, the ports emissions are a very small piece of the entire, the total emissions emitted in the district by all sources that operate in the district. And which isn't surprising because the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District is a very large district. It encompasses quite a few square miles and there's a lot of emission sources in that district. And it unfortunately enjoys similar meteorology to South Coast in that it, it's surrounded by mountains. The air gets trapped in there in the worst times of the year by a high pressure dome that sits over and then the air pollution and the air pollutants can't leave. So there's a lot that's there's a lot of that going on, but the port itself at the most looks like it contributes maybe a quarter of a percent to the overall emissions um, in the valley. Now, that's not to say they shouldn't do something about it. This is a regional look. There are still many localized impacts that emissions can cause and can be part of. And so this doesn't say that, oh, we're not, you can't say that, oh, we're not, we're not part of a big part of the overall problem. Any the emissions are so, I guess the air quality is, is so poor in, in this part of the country that any contribution is probably something that should be looked at. If they can do something, they should. So, um, you know, that's my air pollution control background coming out and speaking out there. I think that was the last slide. Oh, no. So, some observations, as I mentioned before, um, from this inventory. Ocean-going vessels dominate the port's total emissions, which is not a surprise. This is typical of most ports. Um, the other four categories contribute somewhat equally to the remaining emissions. And they, and again, I guess we've already talked about all these. The ports emissions contribute a small fraction to the total air basin emissions. Um, however, that doesn't mean you should say, okay, so we don't put up our hands and say, yeah, when we become a bigger part of the problem, we'll, we'll do something about it. You just, that's not, that's not what other ports do because most ports don't contribute large amounts to their overall air quality either. But there are other issues that they need to deal with and, and should. So with that, I will stop talking and I entertain questions if folks have any. We do actually, Randall, have a couple of questions, a couple of raised hands. So uh, Mary Elizabeth, I saw yours first and then Doug, I um, will call on you next. So uh, Mary Elizabeth, you can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, my, my concern and uh in regards to this uh emission inventory is that its scope uh doesn't entail all of the impacts associated uh with stockton ab617 area or uh you know the greater area so for example you have coal coming from utah by rail so uh, all the rail that moves through the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, uh, Randall, was that considered? Or was just the rail within the boundary of the port? So the, the rail, the scope of the inventory was that it included the rail within the port. And I, it, 
I'm trying to remember, do we, and we feud a, a few miles off to the spurs, the major spurs or major um, switching yards for UP and BNSF. So a few extra miles, but no, it did not include the entire uh, travel through the San Joaquin district. Okay, and then the same token, uh, that same uh, limited view of the impact uh, for truck as well. Right, the trucks were were um, from from in you know, travel within the port, and I think to either the onto or off of. They either started off of or it ended onto a major thoroughfare. So it would be, I think, the four and the ninety-nine, um, or is it the five? And the five. It was both. Five at that point. Yeah. And five yeah, and the four. Both. Yeah. Yeah. So it didn't four. didn't even get to ninety-nine. Right, no, I just went to the I'll first start off on ramp there. So, I mean, these are 1 of the challenges of designing an inventory for a port is where do you, where do you draw the lines? Now, for example, for the ocean going vessels, we went all the way to the San Joaquin Valley district boundary. So those included the district boundaries. Um, it's a, it's an interesting question. There are other part, there are other programs out there that are looking at, you know, the California air resources board has overall authority over all mobile sources. They are developing programs to control emissions throughout the state, uh, including locomotives, including trucks, and they've done a huge amount of work on controlling emissions from trucks. Now, um, that's from a regional perspective, but I understand what you're saying. From, and so the port's decisions with the pilot at this point was to develop an inventory that kind of focused on the boundaries of the port. And Randall, I think is one of the limitations there. I mean, if we're going back in time and asking, you know, for the information. I don't know that um, our tenants or others are going to know where every truck came from. And so it was hard to kind of evaluate where the boundaries of our, our study should be. So that's something though that we're, we're open and willing to talking about Mary and uh, figuring out when we scope, you know, I think we have similar uh, scope for the 2020 emission inventory that uh, I think is just underway. Um, but that's something that we could talk about for sure. Okay, great. I'm I'm going to move on to uh, Douglas. You can unmute yourself. Yes, I I would like to uh, echo um, what Jeff was talking about when we had the tour from the uh, mini tour, and it really educated me more. The thing I, I would like to know um, the presentation when you talk about the high of the water uh, pollution. How how what is your relationship between your between the state that take that take care of the high of the, the the pollution from the from the heat of the sun and make the water really uh, green? Because you know, in the, by the levee, you know, and it's really green and it's smell and all that stuff and very toxic to you know and i don't know what if you have any of uh, uh resource or data about that and what if it's the short term and long term for having those type of resources that instead of waiting for the state to remove it which you should have a, a machine ready to go once we need that thing is building up you know we still waiting for the last minute and oh, oh wow we got the highest all around us smelling that fuel, fuel gas and that's my first question the second question is that um i'm more concerned about the train and the, and uh, and also what meg elizabeth talking about the, the truck route you know and those are the things that i'm more concerned about as well regarding because i get a lot of truck routes coming from I-5 and they go get off on Mount Diablo and make a left on my house and keep going straight to Fremont Street and then go off to Fremont Street and exit and then go on to the freeway to Fremont Street. And I don't know where the truck go, but I think they go to one of those, um, those truck stops over there right on Charter Way or or either watch. I don't know where they go, but I definitely, you know, have a chance to follow with that, you know, but those are the things I'm more concerned about, those three area of those type of pollution that I have seen so far that affect me more in my area. So I like it. Yeah, Douglas, yeah, let me try to address the, the first point. It was a, a you were referring to the harmful algal blooms. Yes. So 
That that is a very challenging issue, and I talked a little bit to Matt about it yesterday. I think he put in a proposal um, to do a study, and the port I've mentioned before has partnered with uh, the regional board and with um, a gentleman, a professor at USC, as well as one of our stormwater consultants. Who are they're not doing it for the port, they're doing it independently, but they're asking us to utilize our, our property to, to access the ship channel and and to uh take samples both of the air quality because there is a concern that the algal bloom is aerosolizing and um impacting people's lungs and, and that's that's a concern for us, our tenants and the community. Um and the folks that are working on the dock. So while we don't have anything, um, we are not tied to that issue other than we want to see it improve uh, as well. And, you know, we, we give boat tours in the summer and, and when we go downtown, you know, you can barely get on the boat because it, it the, the odor is so bad and the water quality is, is so bad. You can't swim. Um, so we do have a machine that is a, that we designed or the Department of Water Resources designed, but we now run and operate it. It's for dissolved oxygen. And so we monitor dissolved oxygen. We don't necessarily monitor chlorophyll. Um, but when we see that the situation is um, really bad, we'll, or if we see it approaching, we're not supposed to use the machine for, for, for algal blooms, but last year we did turn it on for about a week and a half to see if, we could agitate the water enough to prevent the striation and the 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 temperatures and and striation that the algae loves. I don't think it had much of an effect, um, but uh, we did try. We will continue to try. We're working with DWR and with these other folks to submit um, applications to study it right now. And I don't know if uh, if. Um, Matt had to leave. He had a he had an issue, but um, I know restore the delta, Mariah. I don't know if you have anything other to add as far as the algal bloom issue. Hi. Yeah, I do. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, restore the delta is currently working with San Francisco Baykeeper as well as the State Water Resources Control Board and Region Five, the Central Valley. Um, control board um, and we're working on water quality testing and reporting for harmful algal blooms so if anybody here sees algal blooms um there i'll go ahead and drop a link in the chat to where you can report them um and we are having people actually go and test that water um and we are working with the control board to um get that stuff cleaned up. So I hope that that helps. Um, and if you see anything that looks really bad, please make sure to uh, take pictures of it too. Um, and you can send it to my email. I'll go ahead and drop that in the chat as well. Okay, thanks, Mariah. And then your other point um, about the truck routes and the truck traffic, I, I don't know how to address that. Um, you know, it's a concern for us as far as the, the neighborhood and the um, elementary school is concerned and we're, we have a meeting this Friday actually with the city and county to figure out. Um, I think they're looking again at, at truck routes and um, we are going to do what we can to and you'll see something later on in in my presentation about ways that we're trying to route trucks away from away from the, the residents as much as possible. But I don't know your specific situation over there, Douglas. I apologize. Oh, oh thank you. Um... I would just want to make sure that the highest, you know, like like that, the more concern with the highest, you know, brain because I go fishing, I go walk by the levee, I go by there, and also not the delta, but on the other side, there's a levee. Uh, when you go over the overpass from uh, Persian, there's another levee that is is green too, and there they have houseboat, they have. Uh, house behind the levee, they all, and they're green too. I mean, I don't know, and it and it it goes to the to the water treatment right on on Oak Park. Um, no, that 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 park right there. There is another pumping field that clean it out and that goes toward the dead end. So, I was wondering that you are you guys 
are responsible for that, or if that's just another agency that is having are not doing their their job because of the budget? It's the it's the state and regional water quality control board that is that has oversight over that issue. Okay. And I can also tell you, I'm just kind of. Um, I know that I've been working somewhat with Tracy Glaves, who's one of our tenants, but also a big advocate for boating in the in the Delta. She has been working very hard to on the, some of the homeless uh, issues and folks who are these big encampments right along the water. And mm -hmm. she's noticed that they're, you know, putting a lot of of debris as well as as bodily fluids and everything in the water. So that's that's not helping the issue, but. Um, there's a lot of testing going on right now. I believe that that is going to. It's hoping to get to the bottom of of what's causing these algal blooms. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you. Go ahead, Frank. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, I see one more hand, and then we will move on to our next uh, guest presenter, Willie. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, for the presentation. So, a couple of questions I have. Um, can we go back to one slide? The can we go back one slide to the action items? So I know this uh, like I know this obviously isn't all of the action items. These are more so like observations. But I was curious about what actually were the action items from the report since it was done in 2018, and what has been done among those action items. Uh, one so of things, one of the reason I asked this is I feel like that chart that was displayed about pollutants um, per channel could probably be more beneficial if it was pollutants per dollar so that we could see like which clients among the port were the most efficient and which ones were like the least efficient. So that kind of direct strategy for the port of Stockton about where you focus on client relationship. Yeah, Willie, uh, let me take this, Randall, and then if you want to jump mm -hmm. in as well. Um, I think so. What we tried to do here, and and it was done in 2020, so it, it was a snapshot looking back at 2018, which we chose because it was our busiest year. So we wanted to have the worst case scenario, and then work from there. Um, so this is just the raw data that basically identifies what our biggest pollutant sources are. From this, we're hoping to work with with this group here and with Starcrest moving forward. To kind of develop uh, an emission reduction strategy, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about a little bit. I think that makes sense, Jeff. I think it was. I guess the part that was confusing to me was seeing a chart that said mostly ocean, and if most of your revenue is coming from ocean clients, then that's obviously that makes sense. Like that's pretty logical that that's going to be the largest pollutant if that's going to be your largest revenue driver. Um, I feel like that might be a little bit misguided though in terms of actions because it, it shouldn't be more so about efficiency, right? In terms of dollars that the port brings in versus how much uh, a client or a customer brings in terms of revenue. So if like 90% of your traffic is ocean, then 90% of your revenue is ocean, then that, that makes sense. Um, you you wanna find those that are least efficient. Um, so I, I didn't find that those charts were too informative. Okay, well, we can definitely uh, talk further and figure out, um, you know, I think one of the ocean going vessels are our largest pollutant source. I think the it's not about really dollars. It's about and and what is driving. Um, uh, revenue from the port, it's really about the challenge that we have in controlling those emissions and figuring out what strategies we can implement to further reduce emissions from ships, whether it be fuel sources, whether it be, you know, a capture and control type system for some of the container ports, they're able to plug their, their ships into shore power when they're in port. So we're looking at different strategies to try to reduce those emissions moving forward. Yeah, I can just say that this, this is, this is just your first step. So this is the beginning of that whole process that you were talking about. Um, and so. This is just kind of what I say a snapshot in time 2018. It's the busiest time. It's where the emissions were the highest. And this is gives you your starting point. Um, it, mm -hmm. Next steps are coming up with, okay, how do you define who you, who does what? How do you determine that you go on efficiencies? Do you go on, you know, easier ones to control? Do you go on? I mean, there's so many ways you can slice this pie that, um, um, and then this is just to give you a say, okay, now we know what makes up the pie. Now let's figure out how to slice it and, and reduce yeah. it. And so, Willie, now that we're going to do the 2020 emission inventory, what we'll be able to see. So since 2018, we've added 
38, I believe, pieces of zero emission cargo handling equipment. So we want to kind of see the impact on the 2018 numbers, you know, that that uh, some of this new equipment has had and, and it'll that the 2020 data will tell us if we're headed in the right direction and keep going or look another direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks, Randall and Jeff. That gives me extra context. Uh, I guess one quick question before we move on to the next segment is, do we have metrics on how the port of Stockton compares compared to other ports? Like how how are we benchmarking? Are we more polluting, less polluting? I didn't see that here, but I was curious if that was in the scope of the analysis. Go ahead, Randall. Um, no, it wasn't in the scope of the analysis. However, it could be done. Uh, there are some nuances and subtleties, but with with the appropriate assumptions, I think you could do that. And if that's important and helps you decide what to do next, then absolutely something to do. Yeah, I have a quick question for Scott Wall, if uh, he doesn't mind. Um, I know that one of your your board members during the recent CERT meeting mentioned kind of the that they had a ranking of of the ports, and I wonder if that's something that that you could share with with the group, or where or where that existed. I I would have to actually look into that, Jeff. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that off the top of the head. I mean, one of the things I think that's important to look at with i mean doing comparison of ports is just really the sizes of them like how do you compare you know comparatively speaking the emissions at uh like port of la compared to port of stockton because just obviously the 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 nature of the vessels uh very different so you really it doesn't seem to be a pretty uh easy kind of apples to apples type of comparison just off the top of my head but i'm I'm no emissions inventory specialist, so um, I, I I don't can't speak too deeply on that. But it just does seem a little bit logical that it would be a pretty difficult analysis to to pull together. But that's just my uh, uneducated two cents on it. Yeah, I can certainly look into into the other question, Jeff. Okay, appreciate that. And so and Willie, just there's a saying in the in the port industry, it's that if you've seen one port, you've seen one port because they are so different. Um, there's not really another port in California that we compare to. Um, the closest would probably be the port of Vancouver, Washington on the West Coast. Um, but uh, it's it's challenging to really compare them. But we can we can uh, we can dive a little further. I hear you, Jeff. I'm just looking for like how do we judge if we're successful or not? How do we how do we assess whether we're doing a good job or a bad job? Uh, I think. Sorry. I, I think I think if we do this 2020 inventory, we see emissions come down and yet we're still moving the same amount of goods and pr producing the same amount of jobs. I think that tells us we're headed in the right direction to keep going. Yeah, and, and I know other other ports have they set goals or you know plans and strategies and they how well they do to meet those strategies is kind of the measuring stick. So you kind of you could if if it's something that makes sense, you can kind of make your own measuring stick. You don't necessarily need to do what other ports have done. If that doesn't meet, like uh, each port is unique. I mean, we had a, this port of Stockton was very different than many of the sports we have done before. And it was a bit of a challenge to kind of figure out how to get our hands around that. But the, because of that, you may want to have a completely different measuring stick on how you deserve to define success. Yeah, and Willie, I think that's something that we're going to look at as we dive deeper. I mean, my next, the next meeting in my mind is to start really diving in and start figuring out strategies that that at least at least a brainstorm session, three, figure out strategies that we want to try to implement to reduce emissions at the port, and uh, and put together a plan to 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 do that. Okay, um, let's move on, Jeff. If you want to introduce your next guest speaker. Yeah, I think most of you guys are aware of, of uh, Denmark. They've uh, one of our newest tenants. They've come in and done a really good job of, of working with the community. Um, they have given, I think, most of you presentations about their, their cargo. They're a soda ash company. Um, and with uh, with that, I'll introduce, I, I think, both Bill Peterson, who is with Denmark and um, David Ritchie with Star with <coughs> Scarlet. You guys have changed your name quite a bit. Scarlett uh, is is on as well. So, thanks, guys. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I guess I'll just jump right into it. So, I'm sure people are aware. Uh, Denmark uh, signed a lease with the port recently to build a 
soda ash facility, export soda ash facility. And Denmark itself is a joint venture between two companies. The joint venture goes back almost 40 years, uh, was established in uh, Turkey, where the Jenner Group um, uh, mines soda ash, and then in partnership with IMS Group has a port in uh, Dernich, uh, where they export almost 3 million tons of soda ash a year. Um, the two companies, Jenner Group is one of the largest uh, uh, companies in Turkey and is a worldwide uh, conglomerate that mines uh, multiple products, but ultimately uh, Soda is one of its biggest. Um, it has a mine in as a mine in uh, Turkey for natural Soda ash, and now uh, about five years ago, four years ago, bought a mine in Wyoming, which also produces natural Soda ash. Uh, and has recently uh, developed uh, at least two new parcels in Wyoming to develop uh, additional mines. And all of that uh, expanded productivity is intended for export uh, through the Port of Stockton. Um, and then IMS Group uh, is came over here with them to build the Port of Stockton and through the through the company called uh, Denmark. So next slide. Uh, and so Denmark's main purpose in this is to develop terminal capacity for the mines for the soda ash and to operate those terminals that it develops. All right. Next slide. Uh, and so our, our biggest and our most important project at the moment is the Port of Stockton. It's going to be our first terminal uh, development in the US. And uh, as I mentioned, its uh, intention is to handle the uh, capacity coming out of uh, the mine in uh, Green River, Wyoming, which originally was on this map. But it's, uh, I don't know if you can see, but it's kind of right there in the little corner in the uh, western, uh, southwestern uh, corner of the state there, uh, right on this red line, which is the UP Railroad's uh, line. Um, and as it is that uh, Wyoming actually has the largest reserve of natural soda ash in the world. Uh, there's four mines located, one of them owned by Jenner. And uh, as I mentioned, they're going to be expanding that mine uh, in, a, in a, using a new technology for mining. Uh, currently, they do hard rock mining where they drill a shaft down into the earth about 800 feet. And then miners go down there and they operate these machines and they... Uh, convey all of that material out of the mine and into the plant. In the future, the mining will be done with uh, what they call um, um, solutions mining. So they are able to keep people out from under the uh, uh, underground and uh, they pump water through shafts and brings the material out that way. And it actually uses a lot less energy and um, uh, it's just better generally in terms of cost of production. Uh, soda ash itself is a mineral and it's used in a number of products. It's completely non-hazardous. It's actually consumable. Um, it's very clean. It actually, I would say um, a lot of the green products that uh, are necessary for uh, the green economy come from soda ash, such as glass, um, lithium batteries, detergents, uh, various food add additives. They all come out of uh, soda ash. Um, and the biggest point about natural soda ash is it's very cheap to produce, uh, much less so than um, synthetic, synthetic soda ash. So synthetic soda ash is combining various uh, chemicals together. It's um, very highly energy intensive and um, actually has some hazardous wastes that come out of it from the, the uh, process of making it. And most of that is made in China. So this is a good opportunity to replace that. Uh, and, and it's much more expensive than natural soda. So um, this should have a lot of benefits uh, for everybody once we get this production up and running. Um, the project itself is on 53 acres in the Ports West complex. We hope to uh, get up to 5 million metric tons of capacity once the project's up and running. And we have a 20 year lease with three 10-year options. So ultimately this is a 50-year project. And 
it will be producing uh, estimated uh, 50 full time positions at startup, ramping up to over 100 at full operation, and as many as 120 indirect jobs. And during the construction period, which should be about two to two and a half years, about 400 construction jobs. Uh, next slide, please. This is a uh, rendering of what the project ultimately will look at at full build out. This also involves a second phase, which is, um, you know, potentially could be built. But if you look at this, it's a rail, the rail yard comes in uh, and is on top of uh, what today is a landfill. and. Uh, uh, that was from the army or the uh, navy bases time here, and uh, as part of this project, the port will be remediating that property and um, dealing with some of the hazardous materials or, that are out there. Uh, these will come in in big unit trains and then get dumped into uh, a conveyor system, which then puts them into a storage and then ultimately ships uh, via con uh, uh, conveyors are loaded. And this system is totally enclosed, so there's no um, very limited emissions in terms of dust or anything else from from the from the pro, uh, from the product being handled. Uh, next slide. And then these are the main components of the system. So you'll see the rail yard on the left there, and then that moves uh, the trains move through what we call a rail dumper, and they basically are these are cars that dump the material into a hopper which then goes under a conveyor belt. Then there's a conveyor belt that runs all the way across to the dock. And in between there is a storage building that we can store up to 90,000 metric tons of this material on the dock. And then there's two ship loaders that um, load the ship without having to shift the ship around. And uh, it's a very uh, sophisticated operation, very, uh, um, enclosed and um, I think highly efficient. So I'd be happy to take any questions about the pro project. Okay, thank you. Let me see here. Do you have any hands raised? Mary Elizabeth, your hand is raised. Is that from the previous or did you have another question or comment? Thank you. Uh, yes, it was from the previous. Thank you for asking. I'm sorry I neglected to. That's okay. Um, okay, any other questions? I see there's some conversation happening in the chat. Want to make sure that we're addressing that. Um, so this is actually related to Starcrest. Um, Missions inventory, so we'll definitely make note of those. Um, it looks like Willie might have a question. Your hand is raised. Yeah, can we go back to the previous slide? This one. Uh, yeah. Can, uh, sorry, one more. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. The one with all the bullet points on there. Great. So um, I thought this was interesting uh, for like the jobs impact. Obviously, it's important for us in our community here, uh, making sure that we're providing points of employment. Um, I'm just kind of curious how we got to these numbers. Is, is there like an equivalent project that was done at another port that was able to come up with these metrics? Hey, hey Willie, this is David Ritchie with uh, Denmark. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you can hear me. So uh, we ended up conducting a economic analysis that looked at both the, the direct jobs in terms of construction, which is all going to be done by San Joaquin Building Trade Council members, and then also kind of the long-term operation jobs. And then from kind of those base figures that we have, then we were able to, from, you know, other experiences, uh, other port facilities, get the approximate idea on how many other jobs those direct supported um, looking at you know when you know in addition to kind of the you know the large worker or, or the warehouse or, or the account then how does that economic impact further extrapolate throughout and so that's that's where the the calculation comes from thanks for the context um another follow-up question i had was when i went over to the the tour last week i saw that there was actually a lot of um, 
kind of like dust and the pollutants uh, at transfer points between different transportation modes. So for example, depositing uh, cement into a truck or turning a truck 180 degrees to dump their load. And there seemed seem to be quite a bit of, I guess, uh, dust that, that kicked up during those transfer points. Uh, I, was, I was curious about if you could speak about like, what are we doing to make sure like the transfer points uh, is, is keeping dust and retaining it as, as much as possible? So, uh, oh, yeah. oh, please, by the way. You want to take, <laughs> as yeah, far well, as the Denmark project goes, or are you talking, is that what your question is uh, for the yeah, Denmark yeah, project? Yeah, I was, I was okay. specifically asking about how the Denmark project would. Perfect. Would, would, yeah, uh, so perfect. on this, on this, uh, I don't know if you can see, but these are basically self, all the conveyors here are closed in big pipes that are all connected. And then we have massive uh, filters on the, and, and we've, and we've got very long spans here to reduce the transfer points. So there's actually a, a minimal of transfer points in this actual layout. And then at the ship loader, which is where you would expect the most, we actually have a telescoping um, ship loader. So the spout actually telescopes all the way to the bottom of the uh, ship hold. And actually the, the material is just actually coming out at the bottom, right at the bottom of the hold, and then it works its way up. It, it, it uh, retracts as the material fills up the hold. So there's very little space between that and the ship loader. And then the ship loader itself is specifically designed to reduce dust. So it actually cascades. There's a, um, a bunch of little shelves in this ship loader that slow down the material as it rolls through the ship loader so that it's slowing down the speed. And then of course we have a bunch of uh, dust collection systems throughout this uh, path from from the rail yard out to the thing and the, and the rail cars are all self fully enclosed they're, they're not and, and willie one thing i'd add so we, we after construction we won't use any trucking so it's all the, the closed loop system that that bill mentioned with you know rail cars uh, very efficiently at night and then entering the, the closed loop system and, and this is one of the scenarios where where you know being environmentally conscious and, and business practices are aligned because soda ash is more soluble. So we have every economic incentive, in addition to it being the right thing to do, to, to keep it completely covered and, and controlled from the environment uh, and, and be really conscious of, of issues uh, such as spills or dust. Okay, great. Thank you. I see another hand, uh, Nicholas. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this might be a question for Jeff or the folks with Denmark, but I'm curious if you've taken into account how much this new facility will increase the port activity or traffic on the waterways and if you're trying to find ways to offset the, the increase in pollution or if there even will be an increase in emissions because there's this new facility and it seems to be sort of like a a unique facility on the west coast so i don't know does, does that make sense the question it does bill do you guys want to you want me to answer that? I mean, the, the primary uh difference is that i think when the port permitted activity envisioned truck traffic and our facility is going to be all rail traffic almost zero trucks other than for workers showing up or, you know, automobiles for people showing up to work. Um, that's, I think the primary, there definitely will be more activity as a result of our, uh, um, as a result of our facility. But Nicholas, I would say it's going to be, it's going to be more efficient and it's going to be, um, you know, then because another project could come into that same area and, and have, you know, thousands of trucks and, so it's the type of project that the port is really trying to, um, you know, go after. Um, it's it's a lot of cargo, it's a lot of jobs, uh, but it's moving it as efficiently as possible. You can't get more efficient than than rail and 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 shipping. And, and Nicholas, if it would be helpful if, if you could re reach out to us and drop your email in the chat, what we could do is send you a analysis that looks at compared to what was originally permitted for and envisioned under the West complex. And, and while, yes, you know, we are increasing emissions over a, a baseline, it's far less than what's envisioned, in part because we are using things like, you know, the closed-loop rail system 
first trucking, which of course it has, you know, further impact to, to the community. Yeah, I think that would be a great comparison to look at. And I think would um, definitely, I think that's the progress you want to see from the port, right? Is like choosing the right projects. And, and so, yeah, that would be great. I'll definitely drop my email in the chat. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nicholas. And if you'd like to come out for a tour or two, please, please hit me up. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Um, Willie, did you have another question? Yeah, I did. Just as a follow up to Nicholas's question, I'm curious, Jeff and the port representatives, like, what are what are the the trade offs here? What are like the opportunity costs with this project? Um, it sounds like it's a great incentive to create jobs. For our community, um, and especially go towards this, this supporting this product that is more less carbon intensive. But I'm kind of curious. Obviously, this is a big piece of real estate. It's a, a sizable investment as well for the port. Uh, I'm kind of curious. What are the trade offs with choosing this project versus something else? Um, you know, we're 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 really taking a look at. Uh, you know, trying to get away from some other fossil fuels, we we kind of see the writing on the wall that we're going to see, you know, coal probably going away. This is a, a green cargo um, with the greenest modes of transportation um, that that creates a great oper economic opportunity for Stockton. And so that's kind of the way we we and our board and our leadership really looked at this project. Um, okay. I see a hand um, from Margo. Hi. Yeah, Jeff, um, you know how many of the ships in, loaded in Stockton are only partially filled um, because of the weight and getting out to the ocean? What happens with this soda ash? Are they as full as they can be when they head out or do they get topped off somewhere? What, what's going to go? What's going to happen? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Oh, you want to take that? Go ahead. Uh, well, from our, for our project, uh, the intention is that, uh, these vessels won't be topped off. They'll be filled up. We're, we're putting a size of lot and the vessel size that uh, we can handle fully at the port. And, uh, primarily they're going to South uh, Asia or, uh, North Asia. There's diff different clients that, um, you know, we have today that we would hope to grow our business with them as well. Um, so, I think like Japan, if I had to give you the biggest customer to think of Thailand, Indonesia, and Japan are, are the primary, and Vietnam. The customers. But Margo, to answer your question, we could be more efficient on a few different cargoes if we were able to deepen a few, a few feet. And potentially reduce vessel traffic and move more goods. Uh, yeah, a larger size vessel, we would, you know, have less vessels. Absolutely. Our, our load rate will be about 32,000 tons per vessel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think at this point, I'm not. Let me do 1 more round down and up. I'm not seeing any additional questions. So, Jeff, we've got about 25 more minutes for uh, your piece of the presentation. If you want to go ahead and jump in. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so 1 of my major goals for the, the POC is to really work collaboratively with the community and, and you guys to develop a strategy in taking, you know, the emission. Uh, inventory and developing an emission reduction strategy. Um, as well as other mitigation strategies and best management practices for, for running our port. Um, in the cleanest, greenest way we can. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned some of the dust and things like that that we are really focused on and making sure that we can eliminate. Um, any, any sources of dust and, you know, we had Matt out yesterday. We were looking at potentially doing a, uh, vegetative barrier along. Along that cement company, um, the, um. So, what we're, what we're trying to do it really with this information that we have now and with you guys is to develop a plan similar to what long beach and LA have done. They've developed the clean air action plan and I saw in the, in the. Comments you guys were talking about. Okay, well, what's your what's your goal and what, what's your what's your timeline? And that's what we want to outline in, in a plan like this with with your way in with your uh, 
input and with your um, expertise and, and, you know, you care extremely about the community and we want that involved in, in our plan and, and uh, in the port's future. So, um, next slide, please. So, um, so what Randall presented today, um, we want we want everyone to have a good understanding of what the baseline is, what our current emissions are, and begin a series of workshops within the the outreach committee uh, to dig deeper into specific measures where we can implement to further reduce emissions. You know, we think we've we've cracked in a little bit with the with a lot of our uh, zero emission equipment, but um, we think we can do better, and we think we can. You know, that's it's just the beginning in in our opinion. Um, so that that's why we started. That's why we looked at the emission inventory focus, looking at our busiest year to to look at worst case and then kind of show improvements uh, into the future, or even as we potentially get busier, we want to still continue to show the emission reductions. Um, so the 2020 emission inventory will show us where we've made those improvements and where we need to make adjustments, just as we were talking about earlier. And emission inventory. Emission inventories are they're not required. It's something that we went out and did on our own and they're not cheap. Um, so you might ask, well, why would you do one then? And the answer is because we want to know. You know what our challenges are. We want to know where our biggest sources of emissions are so we can go and start to address them and work with you guys to figure figure out a plan to do that. Next slide. So just to cover, you know, some of the other aspects of the plan, um, I think we all know the, the focus of, and the benefits of vegetative barriers as a result of the AB 617 process, um, you know, and their benefits to neighboring communities. So we've started looking at, at where we can develop these barriers on port property. Um, we really want to provide the most benefit to to the neighboring community, uh, knock down dust and 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 noise and and emissions. So. Some of these are just examples of the strategies I brainstormed. So I'd like you to ask some of you to do the same as we move ahead. Um, that's kind of what the series next series of meetings will be is really to start looking at a mission reduction plan and BMPs the port can implement to to really focus to, to clean up our our situation. So we all know the benefits of urban greening. We've been planting trees at the port. We can probably do it more efficiently. I was just as Matt and I were discussing yesterday. He's got a bunch of trees through a grant project that he's looking to maybe re reallocate to another project. So we talked about, you know, if we could do something together to, to potentially add more greenery and trees to the port. Um, so uh, our next meeting also, so we're not we're going to try to stay focused more on the port and, and focusing on emission reduction. We um, we thought it was important to have Randall here to talk about, you know, the starting point, you know, the, now that we have the data, we can start to develop the tools to address those emissions. Um, and so the only other um, folks we're going to have come next uh, meeting just for a brief uh, introduction is the tree plotter folks to give us a brief tutorial. Um, I don't know if anyone has played with the, the technology on our website, but. It's pretty cool. It shows you the values of the trees. It shows you the environmental benefits of each individual tree, uh, the species, the uh, condition. Uh, and so that's something that we want to build out to really be able to show the value of our green space uh, as we develop it along the port. Uh, also, the Boggs Track community, it, they, we can work, we can include your uh, green canopy into into our uh, our tree plotter technology as well. So. I'd like to like to work with the, the community to be able to to add your trees so we can kind of work on this thing together. Um, projects just like our South South Ditch stormwater project is a good example of kind of the, the way we want to change things. Um, we're taking a concrete line ditch that's in disrepair and we're opening up a little bit. It handles 90% of the store, the port stormwater on the on the East complex. And we are turning that into a manufactured wetland that will be a, a real benefit, a biological benefit to to the community. So this is a rend uh, artist rendering of it. I don't know that the fish will be that big in the stormwater, but everything else I hope comes to fruition just like that. Um, what else are we looking at? Um, so yeah, another, maybe uh, anchor anchors here. 
representing uh, the port. They helped us develop this project. It was a, it was a, it's a great project. It's under construction right now, um, but you know, in the future, maybe they could provide, um, you know, uh, presentation to show us kind of other places on the port we could do similar projects that would really have a, an environmental benefit as well as a functional benefit within the port operations. Um, and then I, the only other thing I thought it was appropriate, you know, we, the port is hosting a team for coastal cleanup day. That's on September 18th. So if you would like to come out and work with the port to, um, to pick up garbage around burns cutoff and different debris from our local waterways, please reach out on that as well. And, uh, we'd love to have you guys come out and partner with us and our tenants to, uh, to have a good day of cleaning up the waterways. Um, so next slide, let me see if we're still. So, just briefly, um, I think these are going to be the focus of, of I, I've gone and looked at other clean air action plans and, and programs similar to, um, what, what I think we want to put together here in Stockton. Um, and these, these would kind of be the focus points. Um, but I'm happy to expand the scope of these and, and welcome your input. This is, this is just, uh. Jeff's thoughts for everybody so far. Um, they have not been vetted by anybody else. So, uh, next slide. And then, um, some of the items for discussion, and I had reached out to some of you regarding your position or transitional fuels, um, that the port is considering. There's a lot of interest right now in renewable diesel and biodiesel. And as we, as we look to the future, we know we all want to get to zero emission. Um, I can just tell you from uh, our experience, while we're pretty happy with the way a lot of our zero emission equipment is working, our our best piece of equipment is probably our rail car mover, and it is down probably once a week with different issues, with different switches, uh, or different technology that that the vendor and, and and local support are really trying to work out. It's it it is truly a work in progress, but we're gonna we're we're committed to it. And, um, and we'll get there. It's just when, when I talk to other tenants, um, you know, I think Joe Carrillo's on from SSA who has been a great partner and some of the zero mission equipment that they've acquired and they're looking to do more already. Um, but some, some tenants and some of our partners aren't in that position that they're willing to take that risk. And so I think we're going to have to look for some other transitional fuels in the meantime, until the technology is really built out in, in some of the other arenas and. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, that the group can work on. So when we make our decisions about, okay, what, what technology really is feasible for, for specific areas? Um, it seems like cargo handling equipment has probably been, um, the quickest. Uh, we did just hear about a tug electric tug. I think I heard about it last week and then Matt mentioned it to me yesterday as well. Um, but this stuff is so new, and but we want to keep we want to make sure that we keep up on on the technology, and we're comfortable implementing it and spending port dollars uh, to bring it here, because the last thing we want to do is invest a lot of money and get a piece of equipment that that doesn't work. But um, that's something else I I just want to want to put on the table as we start to develop this plan and start talking further, um, you know, sharing research with each other. I think will be huge. Um, I think that all of you have mentioned different different things, different ideas to me in the in the past that uh, you know that I wasn't aware of. So we welcome all your input and all your um, uh, information. So, next slide. So now I have to this really. Is, cap this is Doug speaking. I do have a question. Oh sure. Yeah, uh, uh, Jeff, I have a question. You said that the tenant that uh, you're not sure about, they're going to go with the uh, plan. How, how long are their lease plan? Are they, uh, can you like, uh, like when you make the lease and you renew them and add it, like, add the, the clause, you know, make it reusable. So I'll tell right, you. Right, right. So newer leases, we can do that. But um, right now we have uh, around 135 tenants. And they're in uh, the the lease uh, terms range from month to month to 50 years. So, um, but the good thing is, is, is the port and SSA have really demonstrated that this equipment can work. And so we're starting to see others 
you know, kind of peek their head in the tent and say, hey, we want to get involved in that. We want to understand. We want, don't leave us out, even though we tried to offer it to them on the first the first time and they turned us down. They uh, it makes them feel better. I think to say, don't don't leave us out on this next round. So we do have a lot of um, a lot of folks who are interested and, um, you know, we're talking to everybody we can. Um, our tug companies, our locomotive operators, uh, you name it, we're talking to them to see um, if we if they want to partner on opportunities to bring cleaner equipment to Stockton. Okay, and, great. thank you. So, um, just uh, you know, I think some of the key strategies, and and this is another early brainstorm, but um, the ideas and focus measures um that we could implement and i have not run these by my team at all so my team might be their jaw might drop but these are jeff's and jeff's only um but i think might be a good starting point for discussion uh, maybe the next next time we meet next month um but i'd love to get your input on on different strategies but you know how do we deal with with uh emissions from ships and and maybe there's some financial incentives the port could offer for cleaner engines um, we talked about the capture and control, the bonnet system. Uh, we are we are looking at that system to see if we can bring that to Stockton. That would be essentially a scrubber that would go over the top of the stack of the vessel while it's in port. And uh, we actually have a team going down to Long Beach next week to talk to to visit one of the one of these machines and and talk to uh, the terminal operators to see how things are working and if that's this is something that we want to. We want to try to bring to, to Stockton. I know there have been, I think there were two technologies that CARB had approved, and now I believe we're down to one. I think one of them lost their certification. So we're seeing a little bit of, of uh, troubling signs there, but we want to kind of see it firsthand and, and see if that's something that we could look at. But um, other things like the tree, clean truck incentive program, you know, we could expand that. We could, uh, we do already. Um, there are pretty strict restrictions on port trucks, and we do have to uh, verify um, each quarter that the trucks coming in either meet or don't meet uh, the CARB certification, and then we have to report back to CARB any non-compliant trucks. So we do that, but there's there's room for improvement. I think there's a great opportunity for electric trucks. Um, you know, the port unfortunately doesn't own any trucks, but I think that we could you know start to do more. Um, and potentially make drayage on the port, you know, we require that they, they use electric, but that's something that, that it is out there. It's something we want to talk about and see if we can figure out a program that we could implement. Um, we could look at for locomotives, potentially limit idling. We've been talking to uh, Central California Traction. They do have, I believe it's two pretty clean tugs, or I'm sorry, pretty clean locomotives. Um, we are continue to bring opportunities to them to see where we can, uh, you know, address a couple of their other tugs, um, working with the air district and carb to try to figure, figure out good programs there. And then cargo handling equipment. I think, uh, we want to continue what we're doing. I believe that we've got probably percentage wise more 0 emission equipment than. Than any port on the West coast and maybe in the country. And uh, but we want to continue to push and develop uh, in cleaning up our, our cargo handling equipment as well. Um, we have been talking to our tug companies. Uh, two of our four tugs, I think, with Brusco have been um, upgraded significantly. I think one's just now coming back online, um, but they are interested in working with us to retrofit uh one or two and so we've we, we've been talking to to the air district and figuring out how we can make that work as well and then the other thing is just as we continue to electrify our equipment you know let's make sure that we're we're using the cleanest energy possible to 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 power that equipment um one of the things we're doing right now is putting uh solar on some of the structures that we've built where the charging stations are um, so that's a good option, but we want to continue to, um, to, you know, turn over every stone as far as where we want to go and how we get our energy and is it the cleanest we can find. Um, I think we're almost done. Are you on the next slide? The truck route. So, um, this is another thing that, that we're working on and, and as far as the Lehigh project goes, uh, we have been talking to them about how, you know, they're up for. Um, they want to come to the port for a new lease 
Uh, we've talked about the dust. We've talked about, you know, making sure that they have the best technology out there to reduce dust and reduce emissions. Um, and one of the other things we're talking about is figuring out how to reroute their trucking routes to avoid the neighborhood. And so we've presented these items to them, um, but I, I want to go beyond just Lehigh and, and try to um, push all, all the East Complex uh, folks to, to avoid the neighborhood and the school as much as possible. I think as good neighbors and good stewards that that would be the least that we could do. So, as I mentioned, we have a meeting with the city and the county on Friday. Um, I hope to, to talk to them further about this and they might tell me that I'm crazy that I don't have the authority to uh, require this, but um, we will see. We'll see how that develops and I'll be happy to report back to to the group. And uh, I think that is my last slide. There's more truck routes just showing how how you can oh. avoid the neighborhood from, you know, Every every option coming from south on five, north on five, coming over on four, east and west, and so we've tried to take a look and and uh, figure out the the best path. It's a little circuitous at times, but uh, it it does uh, achieve our goal. So I think with that, we'll see if there are any questions. Great, thank you, Jeff. Doug, you have your hand raised. I'm not sure if it's left over, but if you have another question or comment. Nope. Okay. Thank nope. you. Uh, so thank you. Jonathan Pruitt. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so I was able to find uh, when in regards to trying to do a truck reroute, I was able to find out more information about the truck company that's on the literally on the corner that technically is not port property. It's get I guess it's county property. Uh, the one that's a, that's on Washington Street um, and actually on the other side of is it Lafayette or it's the one that shares kind of the same road as the box track community farm. It's just on the other mm -hmm. side of that. Ventura. Corner. That's Ventura. Yeah, Ventura. I found out, I mean, they already are developed. They already built. They're building a, where, a little small warehouse. Right there, um, and they got a lot of trucks there and the company is called lead transport incorporated. And they were given uh, a, a lease agreement back in 20. I believe it's 2017 regarding this. Um, I'm just wondering how they were able to get past uh, past this project, given the fact that they're literally. Well, anyway, besides that, I feel like that's going to be a huge thing to look over when it comes to truck rerouting is that that trucking company is going to be a huge factor because they are going to be utilizing Washington a lot. And so that's going to have to be something you guys would also, you know, take consideration, but also work, probably work with them on these things. Cause you know, you have, you have the other company, uh, trucking company. It's on literally on the corner of box track. That's there. Uh, uh, it's in, it's owned by, a I think, a Sikh, uh, gentleman, um, Baj, Baj, whatever, I forgot what his name was. Um, but there are trucking companies really surrounding Bob So Yeah, I, I don't know how they how they got that approved. Um, I think it's mixed use uh, in there. But um, yeah, that that surprised us seeing that thing pop up right there, uh, east of the port, pretty much right in the neighborhood. I don't know, Jonathan, what. I can do uh, or the port. I don't know what say we would have over them. None. I mean, <laughs> we have none. On, honestly, um, we can encourage the city and county to to look at that. Um, the the thing that we do have with our tenants is as leases come up, you know, we can we can re require them to, uh, you know, use specific thing, use specific routes or or, um, you know include mitigation measures in, in their projects to to make some changes but 
I, we don't have any authority over, over those guys and how they got placed in that, that area, but you're right. I mean, trucks. And if, and especially, I mean, we have, we have talked about closing off Washington street so that port traffic doesn't go, um, you know, east into the neighborhood. I don't know what that does to, to, to these guys, if we were able to go through with that. So, um, but it's something we'll bring up on Friday. For sure. Jeff, is the meeting you're having with this meeting county, is that something that's a regular, I mean, obviously you don't have authority to happen to that side or property, but how, how does that coordination occur? Is it a frequent thing? I, I don't, this is the 1st 1 I've been involved and in, invited to, so I don't know yet. I think it's a series, but I, I would have to report back and. Uh, when I know a little bit more. Hi, Mary. Hi, I can't seem to raise my hand, <laughs> so I thought I'd just raise my hand. It's I maybe disappeared, uh, but I believe that in a regional transportation plan. There is a project for four lanes on Washington Boulevard. Yes, so that's on the books for four. That lanes. Is, no, no, let me, let me, let me step back a little bit. Jonathan brought this up to me. I, I think it was just recently. So that project does not go through Boggs track. It does. It ends. It, it starts at the port and goes west to Navy drive. That's the only area that we're talking about widening it. Not through the, not through the neighborhood. And well, I think John. Oh, go ahead. So, Jonathan, I think you went back and verified that that uh, in the document you were looking at that 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 was accurate. Um, no, I didn't. I I just went off of what you said, Jeff. Let me actually oh, okay. pop it up again. Okay. Yeah. I. And any other port folks that are on, if they want to weigh in, I. I I believe that the uh, the extent of the project only goes to the port boundary um, on the east east side. Okay, doesn't look like anyone's going to jump in there. Um, so we can make sure that we verify that and get back to this group. J Jason's jumping in. Oh yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Jason. I, yeah, Jeff, you are correct. Um, it is, it is within the port boundary. So, um, probably in the vicinity of the railroad tracks that cross Washington, um, and West is sort of where it'll terminate. So. For yeah, the I know there. Sort of, yes, there was no intention for us ever to widen Washington and make a freeway through through bogs track. I can guarantee you that. And if it is in any document, we'd like to know so we can fix it. Okay, um, I saw Margo's hand up for a second. Now I lost her, so maybe. No, I'll, I'll go ahead. I was gonna retract it, but just quickly, Jeff, um, I know you're looking at all options for alternative um, energy, and I saw that you included hydrogen on your slides, and um, I just wonder if that's still, it's an active option that, that the port is looking at. It It is. Um... We're, we're really trying to evaluate all technologies. We just have kind of seen a little bit of a drop off in hydrogen and more of a, of a, um, advancement in, in, uh, the electric realm. But, you know, that could change. These things are changing so quickly. Um, it's, it's you got to stay on it almost 24 seven because there's new technology coming out and, and, uh, you know. Especially within California, the goal to get to, you know, 0 emissions by 2030 for California ports. Um, you've got a lot of money out there and, and research and development and people are. They're trying to, to come up with new technologies every day, but if you guys hear anything or, or have any studies that, that could brought, that you may think we'd have, but, but we might not, we'd love, love any information you could pass on to us. Thank you. Okay, it looks like it's the it's well, we're a couple minutes after um, the time allotted. So I appreciate everyone staying on. I think we got through all of the hands raised. Um, I'm not seeing any others. So, um, Jeff, you want to so I know you spoke about what 
like to do at the next meeting, which is really kind of roll up our sleeves and start to work through some key topics, whether it's best practices or technology um, for the emission strategy. So um, I think that'll be our active meeting next time. Um, we're thinking through how we wanna talk about information and make it an interactive session with you all. So hopefully you'll be able to join. Um, and if there's any homework, we will ask that of you ahead of time. Um, if you haven't filled out the survey, we've had about seven surveys submitted. If you wouldn't mind clicking that link, um, we'll send it. We'll send it again in our email that we'll push out in the next week or so. Would really appreciate all of you um, filling out the survey. It's really going to help us understand what topics should come next as we work through our monthly agendas. So thank you so much, um, Jeff. Any parting words? No, I'm just looking through the chat. I really appreciate you guys and your um, your your ideas and and thoughts in the chat. So I want to take a little bit deeper dive into those. But um, I hope that uh, that you know we can start diving into some of this stuff and really kind of roll up our sleeves and figure out um, what what emission strategies we want to start to to really look at and employ um, based on um, some of the you know emission inventory data. So. Thank you guys very much for for coming and your participation and sharing and and being open and with us and um, I look forward to next time. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just stop the recording? Thank you. I was just trying to get there.